And I'm not a communicator in my family. You might know. He was a communicator and his her father's daughter. Thank you everyone for coming to celebrate yeah. Michael's life. We're incredibly thankful to all of you who are joining us and many of you who helped us plan this and put it together. That's how we wouldn't be here um, at this point. And we truly appreciate all of that. My husband, Bill is 64 years in hills. I think <laughs> she wrote, I would say to the brim. Um, and the impact he made on his local communities would lead us all to think that he had lived multiple lives. He was always on the go. And um, capturing his essence today, using words, especially when he's not here to do the wordsmithing, is difficult. Um, it's a daunting task because he was a man um, who lived by words. Both in the sense that he worked in marketing, you know, trying to sell ice cubes to Eskimos or something. <laughs> and um, I'm having trouble reading this. <laughs> Um, and in the sense that, as those who knew him well, he loved to talk. Yeah. Mike loved to talk. <laughs> um, capturing his essence is also daunting because he was many things to many people. And I can tell that by all the different communities that are represented here today. Each of us only saw but a piece of Mike Wagner, even those who lived with him day in and day out. But by coming together today, we hope to eliminate the way that he lit up his large web of relationships and in doing so, celebrate and cherish his memory. As we reflect on his life and legacy, we will hear from Mike's friend, Scott Rushline, Mike's partner in growing the Northeast River Yacht Club's junior sailing program, Charlene Wilkins. Mike's close friend, collaborator, collaborator, and the president of the Chesapeake Bay Yacht Racing Association, that's a mouthful, um, John Anthony. Mike's sister, Sandy Taylor. Mike's employee turned chosen family, Betty Collins, one of the parents who became Mike's right hand through the junior sailing race team, Julie Cottage. Two young men representing the dozens of junior sailors that Mike mentored over the past. 13, 15 years, some big number years. Ian Shan and Luca Webb, and our daughter Rachel, who will eulogize her father before we conclude this formal celebration. Before I hand things over to our first speaker, I Scott, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you who have supported my Rachel and me during what was a most difficult time. Thanks to the help from our family and friends, we were able to spend precious moments with Mike in the comfort of our home before his passing. To reflect on his life with him and to attempt to express to him the love that we and many of you felt and still continue to feel. So thank you for the check-ins the meals and baked goods, the flower deliveries, uh, the car rides to the grocery store and airport, late at night, I might add, <laughs> um, for sharing memories that brought us joy and laughter, for respecting our requests for privacy and your help in providing Mike with as much dignity as possible. They say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it makes, it seems to me that it takes a whole village to live well at any point of our lives. <laughs> and in all of you, Mike, Rachel, and I have found them. 
<laughs> Sorry. Okay. My name is Scott Rushline. I was sitting on an airplane 14 or 15 years ago. I was getting ready to fly to Vegas. I get a phone call from my daughter as I'm sitting there, and I got the, the whatever they call them, stewardess lady on the airplane that tells you to put your phone away. And she's saying, sir, please hang up your phone. And I'm thinking, well, my daughter's running my store, and I, he knows not to bother me. Yes, Amber, what's going on? There's a man here. He insists he has to talk to you. Amber on a plane, I got the lady saying, put the phone away, deal with it. And she says, he's very persistent. <laughs> but Amber, what does he mean? I mean you know, it's, it's the store on fire. You know what I mean? Right? Get off his plane. What is this important? He wants to know about making a banner. Now he had a sign shop. So thousands of banners. He's made and sold thousands of banners working for me at this point in time. Amber, are you bothering me on an airplane? banner. Well, it's a special banner, and he says he needs to talk to you to see if you can do it because he's got an important deadline to meet. <laughs> and I'm flying to Vegas for a week. Take his information. He wants to talk to you. Write his information down, put him on the phone, but it's going to be short. Tell him you'll have me deal with him later. He gets on the phone. Can you help me, sir? I can figure out if I can help you when I return. If you want a banner, I'm sure I can figure it out. <clears throat> oh. I said, give my daughter your information. I'll call you as soon as I get back. So I saved Mike in my phone as banner Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and when I returned, I said to my daughter, who's the banner guy? And I looked at my phone. All right, there he is, banner Mike. Mike hated the name. Banner Mike. Mike got a hold of my phone one day and said, you saved me as Banner Mike and everybody in my world only knows him as Banner Mike. And because it irritated him so much as we became friends, I was never going to change it. Mike and I were very, very different in our orientation and the way we thought. He would say Mike was considerably more liberal than me, and you'd say I'm considerably more conservative than most. And I annoyed the living daylights out of him. And he annoyed the living daylights out of me. But he also became one of my best friends. Because he was one of those people, even though he got under your skin, and then he finally learned with me and with the, the group of people I was working for me and my my network is, as I introduced them to him, we all like to pick on each other. We all like to have fun, but it's always in good fun and it's always, it's always out of love and respect. And as Mike learned that relationship with us, it became a lot of fun to watch. And my respect for him just continued to grow. I ran into some health issues and, and Mike was just there with me. He'd call me after the surgeries. He even he drove me to the hospital a couple of times when my wife wasn't up there. He's just as that friend you never dreamed you would ever meet in life and stepped even above what you could imagine. And I don't know if you can say anything better for me, but that. Even though he saw life through a different set of glasses than I did, he helped me kind of see a little bit of the way he perceives things. I think I may have helped him kind of see a little bit of the way I perceive things. There were areas where we were absolutely alive. How we loved our families, how we loved the people in our circle, how we cared about them. And, and he and I would wrestle about issues he was dealing with, with students in his jail and, and different relationships he had that he was struggling with how to make them better and stronger and i would share the same with him the relationships i had and how to make them better and stronger we came together as friends and he made me better and i don't know that you can say much more for a life to live, and live well thank you
Next we'll hear from Chairman Wilkins. Good so, afternoon, everyone. Um, lots of you know who I am, but lots of you don't know who I am. Um, and as I look around this room today, um, perhaps something that is sad that it might not be here today is the fact that Mike wouldn't get to see how many people really think about him and how many lives he actually changed and affected for the thing. I wish you could be here to see all your faces. I worked with Mike for many, many years um, in the junior setting program. Together, we start, took something that was very small and made it into something where a lot of people were influenced. And I said to myself, well, I should really write something down for this. But then when I started looking at it, what I could write, I said, well, if I could stand here and say something out of the heart of mine, um, that would be quite sad too. So I'm going to try and um, I thought of myself, what, what should I say about mine? And I thought of some adjectives that describe him best. Um, and I'll take it from there. Mike was a workhorse. Um, he was unmatched in what he could get achieved. And he really was an amazing person in getting stuff done. Um, he had just endless capacity and energy. So many of us had no idea where he got all that energy from. He had a lot of energy. Um, he was a very driven person uh, and very passionate. And for that reason, sometimes he did by a couple of people. <laughs> but like I said before, if he realized that, you know, everyone still loved him in spite of that or sort of appreciated what he did, I think he's looking down today and he would be really, really pleased to see all of you here today. Um, Mike was a very, very loyal and uh, generous person. And he was an incredible mentor to so many young people um, at the time that we worked together in junior sailing, I would like to ask all the junior sailors to stand who are here today. These are just, I know they're not all here, but it's a good indication to you. And these are all young adults now, most of them. And they were involved and have been involved since they were little kids in our new learning program from six, six plus years old. And I look around them now, I look around here now, and I just think this is what was mine. And he dedicated himself to being a mentor to you sailing um, at Northeast Raviata and around the bay. Um, many of you may not know, and I know this uh, CBRA person who's going to speak today. But I worked with CBRA for sailing for many years as well to promote junior sailing. Whatever Mike did, he never did. You guys can sit. <laughs> <laughs> he never did anything halfway. This um, there was always you know go for it, and whatever he put his mind to, whatever project he needed to go and take it, you could rely on him to get it done. Um, you know, the platforms, the, the uh, ram, two times a program. Um, all of our boats that we have practically were sourced by Mike, and he thought nothing of driving across five states to find a bargain for us. Um, and he was walking it. And he was just an incredible person in that sense. You could rely on him for any of those things, and he was just completely dedicated to doing it. Um, Whatever cause he took on, he took on to the fullest. Um, and above all, um, as far as I'm concerned, Mike, if you earn his respect, he was the most loyal friend um, 
So anyone could ask for it. He would do anything for you. Um, go the extra mile, go further than that. But um, I know I could, I could rely on him to, and to do anything for me. I thought about this, I need this done. And he would say, sure, I go do it for you. And I'm going to miss that. This next thing that opens the lips out of all of you young people who I get. And that's not the best thing I can say for being my screen. Um, and I'm so happy to see all of your young faces. And I hope you continue um, with all your life lessons that you learned through Mr. Big Mike. <laughs> and um, I know that you're going to think about it for your life and somewhere along the line. If you're thinking about uh, something that happened when you were doing sailing or racing and something that Mike taught you. Um, and I hope that all along for your lives you will remember what influence you had on you as young people and to take that forward with you. Um, I know that I will miss him. I know, of course, everyone in his family is going to miss him. But I feel his presence when I see all of your faces. So thank you for coming today. Well, I'm that guy that uh, Mike cajoled into being president of the Chesapeake Bay Yacht. <laughs> not, not one year, but two. And my name is John Anthony. Uh, I first consider him a friend, and, and then secondly, as a fellow board member, and, and one that was just a genius, the things that he did. I mean, Shirley's talking about how he, he had, you know, was comparing Doc. I talked to him one. One week he repaired it the other day. And I'm thinking, hey, he's still helping me doing what I'm supposed to do. And and uh it's hilarious because when he recruited me to do this job, he said, you know, he said it's either going to be you or it's going to be me. He goes, and I don't like to glad hand and talk to people as much as you do. I said, well, that's <laughs> that's unusual from what I heard. Like <laughs> um, you know, and it just I think it really does, and you've heard it already, it, it, it really does go. You speak to his fine character as a person, as a man, as a husband, as a father to Rachel, as a father to these juniors, as to people he mentored and folks that brought in the house, and Skyler, who, who lived with them for quite a few years. And, and you know, Mike heard there was a need for a foreign exchange student to find a house. And I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but all of them wound up landing at, at the Waggers. And they were involved in community service. Mike was involved in boards. Stephanie involved involved in boards. They were running sailboat racing. They were doing everything. And I, and I didn't meet Mike until about six years ago um, at the Eastport Yacht Club at a CDYRA annual general meeting. And one of the things that that uh, I you know he he gotten up and what the tradition is is last year's chair or in this case the junior division and Mike had been junior division chair for I think seven or eight years at that point in time. You know, I know from what Rachel told me, uh, he got involved in junior sailing when you were 10, you know, so that's, sorry to disclose your age, but that's 15 years. You know? and, and he's, uh, he's just won at 150%. So, you know, so thank you to the family for allowing him to do these things. Thank God he was there for me because he's rescued my thought life on many occasions. He was Mr. Gitz. Shit. Uh, and, and I guess one of his dear friends gave him a plaque that said that. So, you know, I have to bring that in. Right here, it's there. there it is. What was the plaque? So, no, I'm not thinking anymore. So, but, um, you know, so really over these last six years, I really got to know him. We were speaking two, three, sometimes four hours a week. And I'd come up with an educational concept with a, a past board member. And Mike just was not happy about how things were being marketed. So eventually this guy got upset and quit because Mike and his sister Sandy developed a new website surreptitiously and irritated a few people along the way. You know, I was supposed to do it for two and a half years and he complained so much to Sandy. She said, just give me the thing. I just quit my job. I'll do it. So two weeks later, 
I'll pop some new wipes on it. <laughs> yeah. And, and Sandy said he was feeding her information like it's coming from fire hose. You know? <laughs> so I know how hard he was to keep up with. And, and uh, you know, you all know him as Big Mike. I met him in a little slimmer version. And, and one of the things that I really came to value the most about him was the sense of humor and what he could do for boards and community organizations, and in our case, the Chesapeake Bay Yacht Racing Association, which we call CBYR. Um, you know, I've been around the sport 50 some years now. And, and one of the things I found out is through the personal mentoring I got is, I, you know, we came up with a concept to sail it forward, sail it forward to multiple generations. And that's what's happened because of a guy like Mike Wagner, you know. That's unusual that somebody gets that engaged, stays that engaged for a long time. You know, when I heard 15 years, I'm going, God, I, I barely survived 11 years on the community board, you know. And, and you know, I, I just don't know how we did it for that one. So, but one of the things that, that we did was we kind of reinvigorated that organization, came up with a strategic plan. It was myself and Mike and two other fellows, a past treasurer and a past president. And we wrote it all down and basically started to engage and do these things. And, you know, but, but many of the hours were spent doing that, but many of the hours were spent in conversations about family, children, people, community, government, politics, and, and even our household pets. Because Mike would, would have a dog that would bark in the middle of meetings, which I was kind of hilarious, the world is in. But, uh, you know, when you look at what he did, he was, you know, a mentor to his own kids, to other people's family, but he was junior director of Northeast River Yacht Club. I don't know how many years he did that. He was CBYRA junior division director, I think, for at least eight or nine years. Yeah. Uh, then he moved on to be the Green Book editor, which is a big schedule and a publication. And, and then he became vice president of communication. And he was helping, helping us craft messages to get out to people. Um, you know, we have, we put out more educational things in the last three years and probably had six to 8,000 people attend those things um, in, in, in on multiple topics to try to move the, the sport forward. And Mike was a, a master genius at marketing and communications. And it, my background was in sales and marketing for Johnson & Johnson and Dawson Long. Mike had worked, I know for J&J, &J, worked for Baxter Travenall. He got calls about Poppy Bush coming to visit, you know, and he got a call at three o'clock on Thursday, had video, custom made coats, and had everything done by Monday morning at 10 o'clock. Yeah. And he's advising me on how to not get ripped off on video contracts because he got ripped off by photographers and a video uh, contract when President Bush came to visit Baxter. So, you know, just a few of the stories, and if you'd be so kind to humor me for a couple minutes, but, you know. When I, when I met this mountain of a man, I said something to him about, hey, I'm working on this, this in-person sailor in the seat seminar with this four-time America's Cup tactician named Dave Dellenball. We're going to do it at Maryland Yacht Club. And I'd like to invite some juniors to this thing. He goes, just tell me what I need to do. I'll get people there. So one of the things he did is he, he it wasn't good enough to bring one or two. He brought the whole team. Then he started spreading the word. And we reduced the price 50% for the kids. And one of the things we did, and the young lady may be here, I can't remember her name. I should have probably done a little more research. But I know she was interested in becoming a, a, a professional sailor. Mike told me about this. We sat all the kids down at lunch, and we sat her next to this man. And he was giving her career advice on how to become a professional sailor because of the background work that Mike did, communicated to me, and we kind of made that happen. We set all the kids down for lunch. Um, and, and her dad ended up calling and thanking me. I said, don't thank me, call Mike. Because Mike is the one that made this happen. Mike's the one that was having an impact on these young people's lives. And I just thought, man, this is, this is the, the only way to go. When her dad called and said, you know, this is amazing what you're doing. And thank you for reducing the price, you know, you know for the kids, because we felt as though it was important to do that. You know, at another time, another funny story that, that he told me, and he was very self-deprecating, uh, and he would tell jokes about himself, but he was traveling with Skylar to Riata, I guess was down in the Tidewater, Virginia area, 
and they were kind of in a hurry, and he must have been kind of sleepy. And here he thought he was all dressed for success. He leaves the hotel, and Skyler looks over and says, uh, Mike, we have a little problem here. Some, some of the juniors were laughing. <laughs> I'm sure they've heard this story, you know. So, um, so one of the things that in my and this is Mike's terms, and I wrote it down. He says, he says Mike with great, you know. He, so he leaves dressed for success, and and spiriting Skyler off to this event, and he says, uh, uh, in Mike's terms, he goes, you know, I've lost all this weight. He says, and and while my weight loss has been substantial, it, it was still inappropriate for him to be wearing boxer briefs <laughs> and, take, and, and going to that regard of his boxer briefs. And Skylar was the one that said, and Mike, uh, you yeah, may need to stop and I'll run to the store. So they went to wherever they went, Walmart or whatever, so that Skylar could buy shorts for Mike. And that, that's a pretty deal. So, so when I listen to this, you know, you laugh hard. Um, and, and then I had tears in my eyes and laughed so hard that day. And Mike is, you know, just cracking on himself. And But what I liked about that was, you know, that he could share, share a sense of humor. He could share his humility. And one of the things that I found is that that always just tells me how some, humble somebody really is in the, in the big scheme of things. And he spoke very highly of our family, Stephanie, Rachel, Sandy. Um, I I was trying like hell to get them to the neurologist we use for my sister, and it didn't work. And sorry, so maybe we'll pull apart. But you know, all I know is that he's really proud of his family. Rachel, what you're doing in political science, we had several long conversations about that. And how you're already networking into the upper echelons of people that are connected in the political world, and and what you're doing is so important because people need to understand that. And the irony of it all, <laughs> yeah. Here's here's your father passing away at what I consider a young age these days, and and you're doing your dissertation on death and dying and how that and how politicians deal with that, and and it's just it's amazing. And I know you've been a rock for your mom, for your family. And Sandy, you've been the same. The rest of the family has, I, I know. So, um, and, and we bonded quite a bit. And uh, I think one of the things that I was very impressed was that Michael was a go-getter. He bonded with his sister when their father died at a young age. And that was over sailing and sailing on aqua cats. So what does Mike do? He overachieves, you know, starts a dealership as a teenager. Flies to Charleston, South Carolina. The company wants to fly him out to meet this hotshot distributor. And here's a 16-year-old, 17-year-old kid in the top of the plane. You know, and he's and he made enough money to buy cars in high school and college. So and again, it's just you know the way he was and, and the way he welcomed people in his home, whether it's Auburn or Skyler for a number of years, and how he mentored these people. Um and people have already said it, but I'm going to repeat it. But you know, he was filled with passion for people. Uh, he was a man of integrity, honesty, brilliance, and he had a willingness to sail our sport forward, which I will be eternally grateful to for him and and to the future generations that are sitting here. And to the family, my deepest condolences, and, you know, on your loss. And and thank you for sharing him with us. I really do appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> and next we'll hear from my dad's sister, Sandy Taylor. Well, like Stephanie said, I think I can do this, so I'm going to try. Um, I'm Sandy Taylor, my sister. Um, some of you know me as family, and some of you know me through my work with Mike Brady and CB Wire and the Northeast River Youth Sailing Foundation websites. This is my daughter, Haley. <laughs> um, she's up here in case I can't make it to this. <laughs> um, but I wanted to share with you a little bit about um, my brother and our story. 
So a typical phone conversation with Mike never started out with, hi, how are you? It was sometimes just one word like, well, or so, or oh my God, you're not going to believe it has happened. <laughs> or guess who just reared their ugly head. <laughs> and my personal favorite was, you just can't make this shit up. <laughs> So you might have had conversations like that yourself, but it was always because something really crazy was happening in our lives. And Mike and I had, um, he was my go-to in all circumstances. We both had a very unique and special way of communicating and really got each other, but it wasn't always that way. Um, our dad um, passed when I was just three and Mike was seven. So we were essentially raised by a single mother. And um, what developed was a triangle. And it it wasn't, it didn't promote harmony. So once we became um, young adults free from that environment, we um, kind of developed an independent relationship away from the triangle. And I had the honor of having my brother walk me down the aisle when I got married. And we comforted each other through the difficult loss of our grandfather. And my grandfather was like, essentially took over kind of the role of my father. Um, we enjoyed an amazing trip to Emerald Isle as young married couples and frequently got our families together once we had kids. And over the years, we were able to analyze and dissect our upbringing and expand and empathize, um, and sometimes even joke around and get a good laugh about um, the interesting, bizarre, and colorful memories. And I, it was truly great therapy to be able to do that together. Um, and it was only something we could do because it was just the two of us. I have to say that after my mother died um, in 2015, our relationship really took off. And we were essentially all that was left of our nuclear family. And that just mattered a, a lot to the both of us. And we drew very close to fighting each other and creating a wonderful bond. And I relied on him to tell me the unvarnished truth, as Mike could do. Um, <laughs> Tell me when I'm stupid, silly, or laugh at me when I do crazy things or sympathize with me when I'm helpless and I can't change or solve what torments me. And he was my rock, my advisor, my counselor, my sounding board, my reality check, my friend and confidence, but most important, my family. And I just never pictured my life without him. Those of you know who who know Mike well, know that he was not transactional. He gave of himself expecting nothing in return, and the word I can't wasn't in his vocabulary. He would rather not do something at all if it couldn't be done right. And he had an incredible work ethic. Mm -hmm. And because of this, he juggled a ridiculous amount of projects and responsibilities, not wanting to let anyone down. And above all this, he was a proud father, devoted husband, and a fiercely loyal friend. I am so thankful for this amazing selfless person that I came to know outside the triangle. And he showed me time and time again how much he cared about me, his family, his friends. And the lives he touched through his 64 years of life. And for myself, it, the loss has just collectively been painful. And I loved him, and I will miss him every day. Now we'll hear from my dad's good friend, Benny Holmes. 
I don't usually speak in front of large people, so forgive me. <laughs> and I have written down. Um, I and my family have been friends with um, the Wagner family for over 30 years now. Mike and I first met in way back in 1992 when I interviewed for a marketing position at ISTED, um, a healthcare company that was located at, in Princeton, New Jersey. I first need to give a little background about this interview. At the time, I was working for a company that would interrogate you about any time you took off. Um, I needed to interview outside of the usual workday. Mike gladly accommodated this scheduling the interview for a late afternoon at his home in Chester Field, New Jersey. Looking back on this story, I realize it may not have sounded like the wisest idea to interview with a stranger at his home. Yeah. <laughs> it was thought to be a very rural, secluded area. Did I mention that it was also after dark? <laughs> and there was a long winding road that led up to the house. <laughs> But there were extenuating circumstances to consider. My current job was untenable. I was actively looking for a new job. I'd also spoken to Mike on a, um, to Mike a number of times on the phone, and I felt completely comfortable. This is what I would soon come to learn about Mike Wagner. He was definitely an out-of-the-box thinker. When he saw a problem, he figured out how to solve it. I immediately felt at ease in interviewing with Mike. It did not hurt that Stephanie was also home at the time. Agreeing to interview with Mike at his home was one of the best decisions I have ever made. Not only did I survive the interview with him, but I was hired. Mike was one of the best bosses I have ever had the pleasure of working with. With Mike came the bonus of getting to know his wife, Stephanie. I lifelong friendship with the Wagner family soon again. The birth of my son, Alex, in 1996 was followed just nine months later by the arrival of Rachel. I still remember Mike calling me a few weeks after Alex was born and asking if Alex needed a prom date. <laughs> I, have no, I, already, I have no idea how Mike already knew he and Stephanie would be having a baby girl. Of course, it turned out he was right. Having children close in age, there were many, many family gatherings, birthdays, holidays, vacations to Niagara Falls, trips to the beach, camping trips, and many trips to the zoo. Because of my, my children, Alice and Jenny also had the fortune to attend the NERYC summer sailing camps. They will always have great memories of having partaken in an experience. Another one of Mike's best qualities was his honesty and his candor. I truly appreciated that you always knew how he felt about something, whether it be a current event or a personal problem that you might be having. You always knew where you stood with him. It is and will continue to be difficult to believe and process that Mike is no longer with us. He was larger than life, much larger than his height of six foot four and four inches. I'd like to close my eulogy to Mike with a quote by British author A.A. A. Milne. How lucky am I to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard? And we'll now hear from Julie Kamala. Oh. <laughs> Just in case. Mike is here. No, I didn't expect Mike uh, to come Mike. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Julie Cottage. I'm one of the sale team moms. And I want to tell you about my mom. He was such a force in our lives, but this will be about 10 minutes and a lot will be left unsaid. We are all unique, each special in our own way, but there really are some people who are just more so than others, people who single-handedly make a big difference. Our friend Mike was one of those people. It was hard to find words to share that Mike was for us, until we found his writing by none other than William Penn, who, way back when, must have been lucky enough to have a friend just like Mike. He said, a true friend unbosoms freely, advises justly, assists readily, adventures boldly, 
takes all patiently, defends courageously, and continues up when unchanging. My share of this thought, <laughs> listened and advised, plenty, went way above and beyond in helping not just the kids, but their families, led the way on so many adventures. And it must be said, did try to be patient, or was it that his patience was tried many times? <laughs> he defended the kids and the programs courageously and vigorously and remained a steadfast friend unchangeably because Mike was always Mike. While then her parents were often surprised that, to learn that Mike had a day job, which I know I was, <laughs> it was clear that his real work was junior sailing. He helped with many aspects of our Learn to Sail program, collaborating with Charlene Wilkins to bring kids into the summer camp. Then Mike took the sailors who wanted to also race under the Bay Racer team. Mike and Charlene taught and inspired our kids and called out something bigger in all of us. Our kids grew up under Mike's way. You'll see lots of pictures here of the whole And now you see them all going up. I admired that Mike took things to the next level. And if you knew him, you probably thinking and how. I'm thinking of how he saw the things in our kids and what he saw needed to be done to help that mission become true. So in addition to his enthusiastic support of the kids, he got involved in the organizations that supported him. He was sail chair here at NERC. He joined the Mid-Atlantic Interscholastic Sailing Association. You heard he was on the Chesapeake Bay Yacht Racing Association for years as a junior program chair and moved on to other roles. And these were not vanity seats. He dug in, he participated, and he drove thoughtful change all the while still running practices with goddess and resilience of little things that he was doing and fixing to help his crew. One example of Mike's big picture of making changes was working with parents to establish a nonprofit to help kids on the Northern Chesapeake while having access to have access to sailing, the Northeast River Youth Sailing Foundation. Mike was president of this grassroots group, and along with other new Merck Junior Sailing parents on the board, they give financial support and awards to expand sailing opportunities for young sailors on the bay. All this is to say that Mike was everywhere. He still had that day job, remember? Working on this thing with the kids, and he was always jazzed about the possibilities of how it would be when it happened whether it was built fair, being more fair, or fixed, again. He was a master at creating a collaborative infrastructure. Most of us got caught up in the courage of his work. Honestly, I never thought I would tell a trailer full of boats, and I don't think Tina Webb did either. <laughs> I do think that Mary Shorty and Chris Ronald already knew how, but they were not expecting to be throwing massive bingo fundraisers, living on the road all summer, hosting international coaches on multiple summers, or any more than the Crandalls were thinking that they would be running rain up better regardless. Neither did the O'Neill family, neither did the Hooper families. Eddie and Rob were packing traveling kitchens to cook in team houses, army style, but better. And also out in the water with West End Zell while the kids raced, and they took the trailers too. Ryan Essex did not expect midnight calls to help fix a floating dock on a stormy night, but he did get over to the club and work with Mike and John, headlamps on in the rain. With Mike, we did all that and more. In pretty quick order, we went from a team to a tribe, connected by sailing. Because Mike was so quickly all in for the kids, we were all in together too. We went to each other's houses. The kids had sleepovers. We met for pizza, sushi, pool parties, paintball. It was fun. I talked to Mike so often on the phone that my husband complained about it. So 
this one here, I actually asked for an airpod here so that I could talk to my and do my chores at the same time. It's just like if Mike, Mike asked for a little bit of help, we were all so relieved to do anything compared to all he was doing for us. And you've heard it, Mike could talk, but his talk was rarely idle. Things happened. It wasn't unusual to have a chat with him about something and then bump into him later talking to someone else about the very same thing. And then before you knew it, a change happened. One example was a chat about how irritating at regatta award ceremonies, they always called the skipper up, like that other person in that double-handed boat had nothing to do with that win. <laughs> yeah. So I took that talk around, and now the CBYRA not only acknowledges both the skipper and crew for awards, the crew member race results are also reported individually. And that's a big deal if you're the other half of that. That was, that was a little thing he did. That was just a, and he was so hands-on creative. He could, we could turn today into a show and tell of all the things Mike personally made, from cool shirt designs for regattas to unique awards, unique awards for sailing events. He bought a commercial so crazy. He bought a commercial sewing machine and he made name patches for all the kids' boat covers. And he made whole boat covers for the camp boats. He created professional boat name decals when anybody got a boat. And just because he was generous and sneaky, when the Ronalds brought La Perla, he just made the uh, like the sail covers and the tiller covers. Like, yeah, you know, he bought the fabric. It was professional and it was a surprise and it was a very nice thing to do. I'd be remiss in not mentioning that Mike hated spending money he didn't have to. <laughs> he was generous and he was frugal. He loved a bargain and he was a Craigslist wizard. <laughs> he found many of the kids' boats and often picked them up many states away, as was said, only if the deal was right. The team spent many a night on the road in budget motels that might pay because, <laughs> because breakfast came with the room. <laughs> We ate in diners that will remain nameless. <laughs> it took the kids a good while to get him to move from Golden Corral to Chipotle. <laughs> that was a real upgrade. <laughs> and he could fix anything that was worth fixing. Mike did this thing I think of as home workshops. He knew how to do a professional job for just about anything you can think of. He took care of all the club boats, refurbishing everything over the winter. You've heard about that. Almost everything he did was new again. So when there was something that went wrong with one of our own boats, he was really eager to help. Uh, you'll hear about this. He worked on, he wanted to work on Jamie's flying off me. And it was, by the time he got around to it, it was full on winter. No problem. He said, first, we had to wash the boat out in the snow. <laughs> and then he had to clear out our sunroom so that he could do the fiberglass work right in my house. <laughs> the whole time Mike was giving us lessons so we would be able to do it ourselves again later if we had her. Another time, John wanted to work on his whaler, and so Mike offered to come over and lend a hand. At one point, Mike accidentally drilled a hole all the way through it. <laughs> so this workshop included a new chapter on how to fix all holes. <laughs> he was really happy doing these kinds of workshops, spending friend time and knowledge too. He heard the University of Delaware sail team wanted to install a floating dock for the FJ boats. They're pretty big. So he worked up a building plan complete with IKEA-like directions, printed out for everyone, assembled a work party of the junior families, UD sailors, and NERC members, and now we have a grade A floating dock. In fact, it was so great, we built two more. <laughs> and if you look out there, you will see our three grade A docks with boats resting on them right now. As you heard, our launch ramp was in really bad shape, and Mike started talking to people with ideas, and it turns out there were a lot of ideas out there. Um, Brian heard of some surplus guy like Jabib away, and one long trip road one long trip road trip later, 
Mike and Brian found an innovative way to use scaffolding and they built a very durable, safe metal ramp. It took a while, several work parties later, voila. If you look out later, you'll see that out there too. But it wasn't always work. He got really excited when it was cherry season. <laughs> yeah, he invited us and my family to meet his family for cherry picking. And we went out there and we did our best. <laughs> Mike hit a hundred dollars worth of cherries. <laughs> and that is not counting on me. <laughs> and then there was blueberry season. And I always look forward to that because I would drop the kids off at sale camp and I would meet Stephanie out there and pick before it got too hot. But Mike was excited as he would think about all the smoothies he would make for himself and Skyler in the morning. <laughs> and this is a weird story, but we never knew until this happened how cute goats were. <laughs> the Webs had a really tricky piece of land, and to clear it, they brought in this herd of goats. And Mike were got out, and Mike just had to see it. And when he got there, he just was so delighted with these guys. He went, Every day, <laughs> and you have to picture this big Mike would get in like the brandy bit with these ghosts, and he just let them climb all over them, and he was just tickled with them. And I really think that's where he got that really bad poison ivy. <laughs> but he did that against the goats <laughs> not for a minute, I and mean, we were all really sad to see them go. So while Mike was the hub of our tribe, it was a two-way deal. He would ask and seek help and advice. He shared Randy Rainbow songs and movie recommendations. He talked about his family and his friends. Randy was just finishing high school when these kids uh, and moving on to college when these kids were coming up, but they knew each other from crossover seasons. And you all know, he's so proud of her. And he often talked about what she was doing and he spoke with admiration, love and respect for Stephanie and the odyssey of the mind, her crafting and always bowed to her racing rule expertise. <laughs> <laughs> and we already knew Skylar. In addition to Skylar's sailing talent, Mike often admired Skylar's easy way with people and a natural ability with them that not everybody has. If you knew Mike, and we do, you knew what he thought about things and people. I know he cared for each person in our tribe, child and adult alike, almost as much as his own family. If one of us had a problem, he wanted to help, and nothing made him happier than hearing from or about one of his out of the nest kids because sailing was only where that connection began way back when. What this one man did, with his above and beyond leadership, commitment, and personal hard work, impacted and changed this club. Chesapeake Sailing and our club. His influence was profound and his imprint will be lasting. He was extra special. In closing, author Anna Taylor said, some people arrive and make such a beautiful impact on your life, you can barely remember what life is like without them. We find ourselves in a position where we must not just mourn life's past. Celebrate the gifts and the love about how our lives have been enriched because of them, the friendships around the bay and indeed the world, and the laughter and lessons we were holding apart. Thanks, you, Thank you. And now we'll hear from some representatives of the junior sailors that you've all been hearing so much about. I also hear that there's other junior sailors who'd like to share some of their memories. I invite you all after the formal celebration to go upstairs, have some, some Bella's pizza, and maybe we can share some of those additional memories together once we're finished with these formal speeches. Tales from the Road. Mike's tagline were bragging and emo blast about the accomplishments of his family of young sailors. 
Mike was a bunch of letters with things that he really believed in. Here's some wall space. In big, bold letters was the subheading for it tales from the road he last in 2018 when Lockdown Hooper and I took first place in the 420 class at the Man State Championships. That email probably went out seconds after we awarded the prestigious Terry Hutchison trophy. Mike was giddy with excitement to see junior sale trophies that have previously only lived at the Annapolis Airport spent some time in the Northeast. <laughs> And much to the delight, a good number of these trophies subsequently spent a few more years on the walls of the Northeast of Yakla. It would take days and weeks to recount all the memories created over the 10 plus years that Mike nurtured in ARC's junior sailors. It would take even longer to acknowledge just how big being a part of the team with his family has impacted each of the sailors. My name is Ian Shan, and I'm one of the senior members of the NARC junior race team. My name is Luba Webb, and I'm one of the youngest members of the NERC Junior Race Team. The tale we want to share, to share today is an attempt to capture a small snapshot of the memories and the lasting impacts that Mike first career at Central to creating for us, and for so many other young sailors. Our Tale of the Road with Mr. Mike weaves together a collection of individual stories and reflections in a manner that we would hope to make Mike proud. No single word can fully capture the extent of care, compassion, headache, heartache, and loads of sweat that Mike poured into the ARC's Junior Sail Program. The Learn to Sail Camp, the Junior Race Team, and the High School Interscholastic Team. His heart went into each one of these programs. He gave them structure and the support, and he worked tirelessly behind the scenes to remove any barriers for growth. Sometimes moving barriers meant finagling and outfitting a new travel trailer so that more boats and sailors could be hauled to a regatta down the bay. Sometimes moving barriers meant getting a seat on the junior sailing governing bodies so that rules could be amended to accommodate what he thought and saw was the changing world of junior head of junior sailing. Nurse junior sailors were thrilled when Mike muscled his way into the MDISA and successfully pushed for a rules amendment to accommodate the composite team, mixture of kids from different high schools all to be on a single team. That was how the Northeast River High School Road Warriors came into being. Olivia Sower remembers how incredibly supportive Mr. Mike was the year she raised a part of the NERC team. She was so impressed by how he took the time to explain summer racing and recording logistics for sailing with the NERC team, even though she lived in Southern Maryland. She experienced the same care and concern a few, year, few years later when she was coaching at the Sailing Center Chesapeake. And Mr. Mike offered guidance and helpful tips from his past experiences. At one regatta in Lewis, he was concerned about the size of her coach boat based on the weather conditions and offered her a spot on the North Coast. His kindness meant a lot. Lucy Pascoff is another sailor from Southern Delaware that was recruited in the Mike's junior sail family. He was one of those amazing people who would do anything to see people fulfill their full potential. The day after Mr. Wagner received the hand drawn thank you card she made for him, he quickly got her on the phone to talk about creating prints, an art website, and ultimately a business. <laughs> one of Lucy's core memories is, an excite is the excitement in his voice as he called her from the frame section in, my in Michael's. He had taken her drawings and framed copies to give them out of CBRI High Point winners. Mike's involvement with CBRA opened the door for NERC's senior sailors to attend more goddess, but it also opened the door for NERC to host them as well. Mike loved inviting young sailors to race against each other on the Northeast River. And to this day, NERC remains a favorite regatta venue for both junior and collegiate sailors alike. Ian Ronald shared how proud he felt the first time NERC hosted its own regatta. Mike pulled out the stops with little details to make everyone feel welcome and valued. He organized breakfast and lunch for the parents and an assortment of awards and prizes for the sailors. Mike just somehow made that happen. And it was like we were finally an official C-18. It felt great. Hosting our own regattas was not only a moment of pride, but also an opportunity for learning. Liana Webb's favorite memory of Coach Mike was when she did the race committee with him once for the first regatta. He was in his element when he was teaching her about what they need to do as a race committee. 
He was an amazing person and a role model for the whole race team. He passed his Corinthian spirit on to not only Liana, but every single one of us. Most of us probably don't remember those summers when the next junior sailors attended maybe a handful of regattas between June and August. But what we do remember is how Mike's love of sailing was so infectious that shortly after dipping our boat into the junior racing circuit, the kids voted unanimously to attend every regatta offered throughout the Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> Mike responded to the show of commitment with his now infamous moving barriers to growth mindset. For the Fudge and Junior Race team, Mike recruited the best available local coaching, local coaching expertise. He begged and bargained for trailers and coaches. One of the coaches from the early days, Xander Brown, said hands down his favorite memory is when Mike let him name the coach book that was brown with fast turned lightning. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't long before Mike took the NERC junior race team to the next level and hired professional coaches from Argentina. These incredible coaches elevated the sailing skills of each and every American junior sailor, brought new energy to the American junior sailing family, and expanded all our connections to a wider sailing world. Many of us maintain continued friendship with coaches Juan Manzini, Nicolas Vidal, and Bingo. Mike loved and respected each and every one of these coaches and got as much from their time with us as the kids did. Those summers of intense junior racing produced a ton of memories, capturing fun and funny times both on and off the water. A few classics are included in this tale. But now you have to keep in mind that when Mike agreed to facilitate getting NUIC junior sailors to as many regards as possible, it didn't just mean getting the boats from point A to B. It meant making sure that all the sailors had transport and in some cases lodging. Many of the summer many of the summer regattas were during the week. Not all the parents had the flexibility of time that Mike seemed to have. So it was frequently the case that Mike, never admitting that he was probably out of his mind, loaded up with a bunch of kids and sport explorer, called them to a series of regattas, and then bumped with them in whatever overnight accommodations had been arranged. While he may have grumbled when he had to step around sprawled out preteens in the middle of the night, or when the shower finally opened up, only to find that all the bath towels had been used as <laughs> well. He never hesitated to do it all again the next week, the next month, and the next season, even if he might have wanted to ring a few nights. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie and Skyler both remembered one of these moments following a junior regatta in Trayvon. It was the end of a long two-day regatta. Trailers were loaded, cars were packed. Mike, Skyler, and Robbie were ready to head back to North East. Robbie uh, Robbie remembers Mike hopping out of the car to check the trailer and ensure all boats are securely tied. Skyler realizes he forgot his sunglasses, so he went back to the inside of the club. Skyler asked Robbie to tell Mike what he was doing. Robbie then forgot to tell Mike. <laughs> After a bit of time, Skyler gets a call from Mike, an angry one. He's yelling up a storm. He just realized Skyler wasn't in the car when he pulled away, and there are no now a good bit down the road. No need to point fingers at who forgot to tell Mike Skyler wasn't in the car to still get a good sense of what happened. <laughs> Robbie's recollection is when they were about 20 minutes down the road before Robbie hears Mike say, Wait a minute, where the blank? <laughs> Mike had suddenly noticed that the passenger seat where Skylar was sitting was empty. <laughs> Robbie remembers feeling really bad for the steering wheel and center console of the Ford Explorer as they bore the brunt on Mike's frustration. They <laughs> clobbered with hammer fists for a good five minutes. <laughs> the story ends happily with no one getting left behind, the Ford Explorer escaping without any sustained damage, <laughs> and Mike ending up with only a few more gray hairs. <laughs> A good number of the memories from the days on the road with the Nerd Junior Sales family have to do with Mike's strength. Jamie Connors thinks Mike was the strongest man he knows. <laughs> Remembering when he was just eight years old and Mike fixed an Opti sprint pole by bending it back into shape with his bare hands. <laughs> it wasn't too hard for an eight year old to think that Mike is the strongest man alive, <laughs> but he stayed that strong throughout all our years of sailing. Matt and Will Grammer. Remember one of the early regattas at SSA. A storm came in and very quickly got worse. 
All the sailors were called in and everybody was scrambling to get their boats put away. In order to speed things up, Mike grabbed two laser masks with still everything on it and one under each arm. He marched out of the dock and into the parking lot. One of the masks were even from the other race team. <laughs> Mike was trying his best to get all the sailors and their boats in quickly and safely. It was so shocked. It was so shocking of sight to see how strong he was. Isabella Webb remembers Mike as the strongest person she'll ever know, not just physically, but mentally. His passion for sailing extended to his love for us and the team. And even when he seemed frustrated with us goofing off, we could all tell he secretly enjoyed seeing us have fun on the water. When he would come back, when we would come back from a long day on the water, he would be there ready to help and support us. Other memories are connected to the sheer size. There isn't a junior sailor who didn't ride at least once to or from a regatta in Mike's Water Sport. Mike was always willing to squeeze in as many as we could, but nobody ever wanted to get stuck in the seat behind each other. <laughs> we compared to flying spirit animals. <laughs> Rob Jensen remembered just how much he had to move the seat in Mike's Explorer in order for his feet to touch the pedals. <laughs> it took the seat motors about five minutes to do forward <laughs> enough to find five ten <laughs> There was also the minimum Mike pipe rule for loading oppies onto the top rail of the Nerd Travel Trailer. The kids were all pretty small, and the team was sailing mostly oppies. Only Jay Trentham was able to load the boats on the top rail when Mike, with Mike back in the early days. Even when all the junior sailors all got bigger and taller, Mike still maintained control of tying down boats and checking knots prior to travel. This was because of a harrowing incident on the way to Gibson Island when Jamie's Cottage Opti, which was positioned on the top rack of the trailer, Sailed right off. <laughs> the Oppie miraculously flew over the car, driving right behind the trail, and bounced once before skidding into a ditch alongside the road. <laughs> Crazy that the boat was mostly fine and no one was in an accident or hurt. Jamie went on to have a nice sail like that. <laughs> but every regatta after that, Mike was in charge of the tie down quality control. <laughs> Mike's Sport Explorer was not only the lead car in the junior sail caravan, it was a place where you could find just about any kind of tool, boat part, or piece of sailing gear. It was also a source of a lot of memories. Jake Crandall was the Nurk sail family midstream, but very quickly welcomed by Mike and the rest of the team into the fold. He remembers one regatta when Mike went out of, out of his way, literally, to make sure he could do it. Jake's parents weren't able to take him. So Mike picked him up from his house and drove him all the way to the regatta. Jake remembers how Mike talked about life and college, and of course, Sarah. The couple of hours spent in the club is so simple, yet so full of life. The experience perfectly encapsulated how Mike cared about so many people and never hesitated to help anyone whenever he could. Morgan Essex has similar memories of many car rides to and from regattas and the many, many discussions. Whether it was gossiping about the day, going over race results and tactics, or just talking about life in general, it was always fun. The purple rides are memories that will last forever. And they are just one of the many ways that Mike encouraged Morgan's love of sailing. Mike was deeply committed to the next junior sailor program, but he gave the same love and care to each and every one of the junior sailors who crossed the road to Mike's order. Mike was one of the biggest persons I have ever met. The biggest thing about Mike was his love for every single one of the kids in the Nerf Nerf race swim. No matter how hard your day was on the water, you could count on getting a lap in Mike. From picking up a trailer full of 420s with his bare hands, or even picking up an Opti with his bare hands, to hearing his iconic, oh God, <laughs> in response and one of our many stories from the crowd. No matter how bad you did, all he cared about was us getting back safe, learning from the experience, and having fun. <clears throat> he cared more that we loved the sport and the people we met from it than being on the top all the time. His mindset has truly given every single one of us an opportunity to be great at this sport. He's changed every single one of our lives. Busy Cottage shared that Mike was many things, kind and strong, and always looking out for all of our best interests on and off the water. He believed in each and every one of us. He also remembers he did 
enjoy a bit of gossip. <laughs> Mike did so many things to make to make each sailor feel special. A few things he did included customizing sailor covers, teaching sailors how to fix boats, creating special awards and opportunities for recognition, and making sure kids got registered events. The list goes on. Alex Walters shared his memory of the day when he was towing his newly purchased International 14. The club, when it jumped off the trailer, and ended up with a large hole in the bow. It was late and dark, so he parked the damaged boat next to all the other junior sailing dinghies at the club and got to thinking about how he was going to fix such awful damage. When Alex got back to the club the next day, ready to assess the damage, he found that it's already been fixed. Mr. Mike has spent the, his entire morning fixing it and never wanted anything in return, <laughs> other than see the joy that it brought Alex every time he sailed it. Will and Matt Grammer both recognized how instrumental Mike was into getting them onto the junior race team. They're putting in countless hours fixing boats, driving to all their encounters, and putting the summer sail camps together. He was always there for us and solving so many problems. John Cottage had been using his Boston Whaler to chase a kid regardless. Mike was always ready to give him a lot of tips on a boat care and repair. In typical Mike fashion, he would often take a small repair jobs, including the year he installed a new rub rail on John's whaler as a surprise gift for Father's Day. Mike never wanted to let a junior sailor's mile of sailing go uncelebrated. As the junior sailor family grew and prepared to leave the nest, Mike would create a special flag or other memorabilia to mark their accomplishments. He did this even during COVID when no one was sailing or even leaving the house. <laughs> Mike wanted to graduate to wanted graduating seniors Robbie Shan and Lauren O'Neill to know that they were special and showed up on their doorsteps with personalized flags. I have a particularly fond memory of being celebrated by Mike when he presented me with this incredible book. We were at Baltimore County, Mike gathered the team and made a speech about how the team had grown and developed and how much joy and pride he had in each sailor. And on that bittersweet day, he wanted to acknowledge and congratulate the first junior sailor who was now heading to college. This book is something that I will cherish forever. Coach Mike was a natural leader, and we can think of no better person to have led us into our sailing lives. The impact Coach Mike had on our team was immeasurable. To have someone influence your life even after they have gone, is something you cannot take for granted. Coach Mike was one of the most special, strong, and truly caring people we have and will ever meet. And we are grateful every day for how he shaped our lives. How are we to capture the essence of a person who has lived decades, years, months, minutes, and seconds, pouring their energy out into the world at every one of those moments? Our parents often seem larger than life, I'm told, but those of you who knew my dad probably feel that such a description is somehow more fitting for him than the average person, and not just because he was six foot four. My words can only approximate the small part of my father's essence that I came to know during my time with him. So acknowledging that all I can ever achieve is a likeness of the great man that we are here to celebrate, I'd like to share some of the moments that come forward when I attempt to understand him and the impact he had on my life. It is 6.15 a.m. on a Monday morning sometime in 2011. The house is dark until my father flips on our hallway light. It's time to get up, his voice booms, as it did every morning before school. Eventually, I shuffle downstairs, and he is standing in the kitchen making scrambled eggs with the stove on way too high for my mom's liking, but he probably thinks that what she doesn't know won't hurt her. <laughs> and besides, he knows that I only have about six and a half minutes to eat those eggs before I run out to the bus. 
He slides the plate in front of me, and while he slips the lunch he just finished making into my backpack, he asks if I have everything I need. I assure him that I do. Around 7 a.m., once I've actually arrived at school, however, I realize that I've forgotten something of great importance, an assignment, project, change of clothes for an after-school activity. I call him, and soon he is on his way to drop off whatever it is I had forgotten. We repeat this process dozens of times for over four years. It is August of 2021. My father is driving me back to Toronto after the summer break. I always loved that drive because it gave me at least 10 uninterrupted hours with him. He tells me about his grandfather, who helped my parents fix up their first home, even though he was over the age of 19. I am left hoping that I will be able to enjoy moments with my father into his old age. My dad also reminisces about his childhood, and I am struck with the feeling that he worked incredibly hard to give me a life that he did not have. It is July 23rd, 1958. My father is taking his first breaths in Whittier, California, as his mother Lolita and his father James hold him. He spends his early childhood riding bikes, playing the board game Skunk, and taking family trips to Lake Tahoe. It is the Christmas Eve of 1965. My father and his sister Sandy are sent to a neighbor's home as their father dies from lung cancer. So begins our intergenerational story about illness, death, and mourning. And as each member of the family tries to make sense of their new reality, somehow my father finds the strength to still love the world and the people around him, even though he at such a young age had to grapple with love's inevitable relationship to loss. By the summer of 1973, my father is already making money by selling and repairing sailboats. The sailing community has become his second family, and he spends the summers of his youth and young adulthood sailing on aqua cats and eventually Prindle 18s competitively, and also for the love of wind hitting his fist and a feeling of flying. It is the summer of 2009. My father has purchased the Prindle catamaran, which he has set up in our backyard, and comes to me with a hand-sewn trapeze harness. He teaches me how to hook it onto the metal line running from the mast to one of the boat's two poles. The boat is yellow, and the holes look like bananas. <laughs> Weeks later, we sail the Prindle in the northeast, while the wind is blowing at least 20 knots. I am slightly afraid that he might let the boat capsize, but he doesn't. He carefully patiently walks me through the process of picking the harness up and standing as one of the holes lifts up out of the water and with the wind hitting my face, I feel like I am flying. It is Christmas of 2021. My father giddily pulls out the china and pink crystal glasses my grandmother once used every Christmas, which he tells me she so carefully cleaned and stacked. These works of art have been sitting in a box for years, but this Christmas, my father and I decided to give them a second life. His sister and her family join us, and we surprise her by setting up the table with these eccentrically beautiful pieces of glassware. My father also cannot stop himself from putting the Mr. Make Shit Happen name tag that our friends <laughs> just gifted him on the table amid the china so that he can snap a picture. I get the sense that his childhood memories and current identity somehow rolled together in that moment. The day prior, my father was gifted an old Polaroid camera as part of a white elephant game with our friends. We take turns snapping photos, and I'm happy to see that one was able to capture my father's smile. It is June 28, 1986. My parents stand on Laguna Beach, surrounded by their loved ones, as they make a pledge to be one another's partner and friend for the rest of their lives. My father is wearing a light gray suit, and my mother's wedding dress is brilliant white. Throughout their almost 37 years of marriage, they are above all else, one another's best friends. They believe in each other. It is the summer of 2012. Early on a Friday morning, my father and I load our equipment onto our J24 Solaris, getting ready for a day of motoring toward a regatta. He plays music from his iPhone as we pass over the still glassy water. My father's face is full of energy as we talk through the process of setting up the spinnaker for the race the next day. Spin halyard on, spin pull in position, spin halyard up, genoa halyard down, all while rounding the windward march. <laughs> it is the spring of 2000. My parents and I are aboard the Cape May Ferry. 
My mother disappears to the deck below, and my father lifts me up into the air to hold me out over the vessel's railing <laughs> so she can take a picture. <laughs> I just like you afraid that he might drop me. That's it. And as he holds me in the air, the semi-salty wind brushing my skin, I feel like I am flying. It is the spring of 2016. My father calls to tell me that he has itemized and created a graphic representation of my spending habits over the previous year. <laughs> and that I can expect both a PDF and an Excel document to my university email. <laughs> you can fill in the blanks as to what the lesson he was trying to teach might have been. It is 8.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning in the fall of 2017. My father calls me, and when I answer groggily, he then says, Oh, God, I'm sorry. Did I wake you up? He wants to check in because he could tell that I spent over 10 hours in the library the day before through an app that he uses to track my location. <laughs> it's one of the ways he can still feel close even while I am hours away at school. <laughs> it is January of 2020. My father is driving me back to Toronto after the winter break, and we stay overnight in Niagara Falls. The hotel he books looks out over the falls, and we both stand in the window watching how the mist reflects the colors from the many buildings below. He takes me out gambling for the first time as a way of teaching me that intentionally losing money is not as fun as it might seem. <laughs> I think we make about $12, which we then use at an overpriced IHOP. It might have been an expensive evening, but the memories of that night and the way I, he laughed as I used the slot machine will later carry me through some of the most difficult times of my life, so I think it was worth it. It is a Thursday night in 2010. My father and I carry the massive Genoa off of Solaris to fold it in the grass in front of the club. He walks me through it, audibly announcing, announcing each step so we can get the perfect fold for his precious sails. <laughs> After we slide the sail into its bag, he takes it back to Solaris, locks up the boat, and then we join my mother and our friends for the club's half-priced burgers and sweet potato fries that Thursday night sailors could always count on. We watch the sun go down over the Northeast, and it feels as though those summer nights will never end. It is a summer night in August of 2011. My father and I are sailing in the Governor's Cup on a friend's trimaran. There is algae in the water that lights up on contact. I sit on the hull, lifted into the air, and I look back at my father, seeing the outline of his face in the blue-green light cast off from the water. It is as though he is the most alive he has ever been, and I feel like we are flying. It is August 16th, 1997. My mother's water breaks, and my parents rush to the hospital, only to find out that their baby is unexpectedly breached, and my mom will need a C-section. I come screaming into this world, and my father holds me as I take some of my first breaths. It is a Sunday morning in 2009. My family drives about an hour to the Dover skating rink. My father laces up his ginormous skates and takes to the floor, zipping in and out of the slower moving crowds. Sometimes the combination of his speed and size creates a movement in the air so strong that it sends the kids who can barely hold themselves up flying. <laughs> Eventually we decide that for my mother's birthday, we have to rent out the ring so we can play our own music and skate at our own speed without the fear of causing injury to others. <laughs> it is nearing the end of summer in 2016. My father asks me to take a walk, conveniently disappearing, while he asks Skylar, a 13-year-old boy who had already started to feel a bit like family, and he would like to live with my parents during the school year so that he could continue sailing in the fall. To my father's joy, Skylar says yes, though he has little idea of the ride on which he's about to embark. <laughs> It is a Saturday morning in 2021, around 8.30 a.m. I groggily answer the phone and my father says, oh God, I'm sorry, did I wake you up? He wants to talk about something related to the sailing kids that he thinks about more than they know. He fills me in on the details of not only their most recent races, but also their public searches, their scholastic commitment, and his earnest care for them when they face personal struggles. His voice beams with a sense of pride and protectiveness. Even though he did just wake me up, his infectious energy prevents me from being drunky. It is 2004, and my father and I are traveling to Dover to meet with Governor Ruth Ann Minner. 
There is a possibility of the state building high voltage power lines right behind my elementary school. And given speculation at that time that continual exposure could be hazardous, my father leapt into action as both a parent and citizen. He already has a history of civic engagement when it concerns the safety of local children. For years, it is also his personal mission to raise awareness about safe driving speeds in our neighborhood. <laughs> it is spring of 2018. My father is pulled over somewhere in Virginia for driving way above the speed limit. <laughs> and he's, he's rushing to my university having just found out that I have pneumonia. This is not the first time he has driven at questionably high speeds to reach me, and it is certainly not the last. In March of 2020, he hops into his Explorer and drives as fast as he can to get across the Canadian border on the night they closed so that he can bring me back to Delaware. It is the fall of 2021. My father is driving me to Toronto, and as Queen plays in the background, he reminisces on the time that he and my mother worked together. He describes her as the most fashionable, elegant, and beautiful woman in their office. He recounts that when their office was closing, he left a note in her car declaring his affections and saying that if she was interested, she should meet him on the beach on Catalina Island after a sailboat race. <laughs> this would require her to find her own boat ride to get there. <laughs> Luckily for him, she indulged his whimsical romanticism, and eventually it was her sailing as his crew in races. Listening to my father speak about this time in their lives with such tender excitement, I imagined moments where, on the Prindle 18, my parents felt like they were flying. It is the fall of 2005. I am crying to my father about something the kids on my bus had said. He wipes the tears from my eyes and calmly tells me that people can call you names, they can lie about you, they can take away your physical possessions, but they can never take away your accomplishments. I think back to this moment and my father's wise words often. It is a weeknight in 2014. My father walks into our kitchen and slaps a printed out email on the counter for my mother and I to read. He wants our thoughts on some grand message he must send, some update to go out to friends and the sailing community, or some personal matter he must settle. Really, he does not want us to read the message, however. He wants us to listen to him read his creation while eagerly awaiting our opinion. His love of language of each individual word is evident, even in the most mundane forms of communication. It is a weeknight in 2017. I call my father to read an email out loud to him before sending it. <laughs> he has been a reader of emails, essays, and speeches for many years at this point. He scours the page or listens with a level of focus few people are willing to grant. He treats each word as an important decision. I realize that his love of language is an integral part of my own. It is a Tuesday evening in the fall of 2014. My family is headed to an academic school board meeting where my father is planning to publicly advocate for the academic freedom of students and teachers. He has made his presence, concerns, and priorities as a parent and community member known throughout the 12 years I have been in school, and on a number of issues, ranging from curriculum changes to the student code of conduct and the right to free speech of students and staff. Little does he know that a photo of him speaking will make it into the Middletown transcripts the next day. <laughs> it's not shocking to me, however, that his words made an impression. It is January of 2023. I am rifling through my father's desk while he is in the hospital. He has little oddities he's purchased online, including a nightlight in the shape of a moon that had for some reason humored him years ago and which he kept all that time. Eventually, I also find stacks of letters, notes, and trinkets that have been given to him over the years. Some from me, some from his friends, and some from the families he came to love through sailing. I also find dozens of emails to my teachers, my mentors, administrators at my school, always advocating on my behalf with no desire of my recognition for him doing so. I realize that I cannot really grasp the degree of my debt to him. It is the winter of 2018. We are driving my dad's silver explorer. I tell my father that I have made the decision to pursue graduate school that I want to earn a PhD. He asks me how long that will take, and I say, oh, well, somewhere in the realm of five to seven years. 
he laughs and says he doubts that he will be alive to see it. And I verbally protest. In response, he tells me, as he had told me several times before, well, one day I'll die, your mom will die, and you will die too. And that's okay, we just have to find a way to live well in spite of it. It is December of 2022. I just submitted the final draft of my dissertation proposal to my supervisors. I have decided to spend the next few years of my life writing about the human body's privacy, vulnerability, and mortality. It is really a project about death and how we can live well in spite of it. That same week, my father goes into the emergency room with what we thought was a stroke. It turns out that he has a brain tumor. While I am up that night, unable to sleep, terrified about what is to come, the connection between the questions that guide my research and my father's constant teachings about living well in spite of death click into place. About a week later, I promise him that when I finish my dissertation, I will dedicate it to him, not only because he is my father, but also because he set me down the path on which I find myself. It is March 29, 2023. My father is taking his final breaths in our family home. My mother and I look at one another confused, trying to find the moment that marks his departure from the world. The line between presence and absence seems blurry, but maybe it is because we are not only in that moment. I am also the toddler that he held up over the ferry. I am the teenager he made eggs for every morning. I am the young adult he lectured about finances. I am the infant he held as I took my first breaths. And he is being born, he is dying. He is sailing a Prindle 18. He is skippering Solaris. He is driving his Explorer and his Volkswagen van again. He is being lifted into the air in a trapeze harness with 20 knots of wind blowing into his face. He is flying all at once. At least that's how it feels because I don't know how to separate out the past from the present. And I'm left with feeling that it's just not possible for this one moment to hold all of my love for him. That love transcends time, breaks through the demarcation between minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years. It is July 23rd, 1958. It is March 29th, 2023. And it is somehow also today, April 30th. My father is gone. But somehow our love for him brings all of these little moments scattered throughout time back together again. The sound of my father's life has left an unending reverb in us. And while we mourn his loss, we can also cherish his memory, the memory of a man who lived with infectious passion and care, despite knowing the pain of loss that accompanies love. Would that we could all rise to the challenge of living well, of treating life as an opportunity, even amid its vicissitudes, with the same vigor and zeal. Thank you. I think I'm it was really on the yeah. uh, I, I would like to ask for this uh, a silent reflection at this time. Thank you so much for joining us to look back on my slide and legacy. And thank you again to everyone who has supported our family for the years. Among many of the gifts that Mike gave Rachel and me, we took count and to know many of you. In lots of different ways. <laughs> sure. I'd like to conclude this formal celebration with a few words for the many children and young adults that Mike coached and mentored over the years. When Mike was in the hospital this December, Rachel expressed to him that part of the reason she hopes to become a teacher herself is because of the example he set in caring deeply wholeheartedly 
for many young people around him. His response was simply to tell her, well, you just pass it along to the next group. To those who were also touched by my husband's mentorship and leadership, that is how we keep his legacy alive. By passing along his care for education, for sportsmanship, for the Corinthian spirit, and most importantly, for the mentorship and careful upbringing of the young people around us. Mike only had one biological child, but in all of you, he gained many more. Mike Wagner might be gone, but the part of him that lives in all of you is still alive and well. Now we ask that Skylar come up to join us momentarily. <clears throat> Finally, in keeping with long standing maritime tradition, we now ring the ship's bell eight times to symbolize the end. Like Wagner's watch and journey. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and for your support of our family. We really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who's joined us on the Zoom. Um, we hope that the junior sailors, like I said earlier, now might take a moment upstairs to finish sharing some of their reflections as a group. We also invite the rest of you to um, spend a little bit more time with us, eat some of this Yacht Club's delicious food, and hopefully get a few more laughs in because my dad would hate, above all else, for us to be having a pity party. <laughs> Thank you.